Hello, everyone. I'm Jim Garrison. I'm the uh, president of Ubiquity University, and it's my pleasure today uh, to convene our next session of the great books. I'm in Paris. Uh, we have just completed an extraordinary course, the largest course we've ever convened of over 120 people in Chartres uh, around the seven liberal arts this last week. We now have a smaller group of about 30, 32 in Paris with two of our faculty, Andrew Harvey and Carolyn Mace, uh, and we're walking uh, the sacred streets of Paris. Uh, the weather is beautiful. Uh, we're all staying here in the Hotel Danube from which I'm, I'm speaking to you. Uh, and um, uh, delighted to be able to take a little bit of a break and uh, talk with you about a man who lived about 2,500 years ago in ancient Greece, a man by the name of Alcibiades, uh, who exemplified uh, both a renegade personality, a man of both great brilliance and destructiveness, who probably did more than any other single individual to bring down the Athenian Empire into the dust, Alcibiades. And I want to talk to you about Alcibiades. Uh, because of what's going on um, here in the United States. And I'd like to start uh, by just recalling for a moment the rise and fall of the Athenian Empire and the place of Alcibiades. And then I want to shift over to the analogies uh, here in modern times with the United States of America in our generation and then switch back to Alcibiades and then conclude uh, coming back to the United States because I think the historical parallels between the rise and fall of the Athenian Empire and the rise and fall of the American Empire are so striking that they bear scrutiny uh, in our call today. You may know the history of Athens, how Athens um, was one of the small city-states in uh, ancient Greece. Uh, Greece never did uh, become a nation until the modern era. And back 2,000, 2,500 years ago, it was just a series of small city-states. On the western edge of the vast Persian Empire, And around 500 BC and then in 490 BC and 488 BC, the Persians attacked Greece. And they failed. And the great battles of Thermopylae where the Spartans sacrificed 300 of their bravest men to stop the forces of Xerxes coming down into the Peloponnesian Peninsula the great battle of Potia a uh, year later where they were utterly decimated, the great battle of Marathon. Uh, these were the legends that built the mythology of Greece because a small city-state took on the biggest empire of the time and won. And out of those battles rose Athens. And the Athenian civilization, the Athenian Empire during the 5th century BC, starting at about 470, 460, down to 420, uh, down to the end of the 5th century, was of such dazzling brilliance that historians to the present day mark that period of the 5th century Athens as probably the greatest moment in the history of humankind, the history of civilization. As Durant says in his great work, the story of civilization that never before 
or since have so few demonstrated such extraordinary brilliance over so many areas of human concern that have influenced cultures across time and around the world as did the Athenians in the brightness of their imperial majesty uh, in the fifth century BC. And then for reasons that still remain obscure, but ultimately reside in the arrogance of the soul, the Athenians decided that they did not have enough and they went to war against Sparta. And after 30 years of war, they were devastated and they fell into ruin, never to rise again. But for a brief shining moment, Athens was the light of the world. They were a democratic oasis in a desert of totalitarianism. And people honored them. And the man Alcibiades, born in 450, rising to prominence, his destiny intertwined with the Athenian destiny, and he was a catalytic in, ingredient in the collapse and fall of that great, beautiful experiment in democracy into the dust of strife, division, and ultimately totalitarianism. And if that sounds awful lot like the United States, it's because the parallels are striking. In the modern era, no nation has risen to such brilliance and majesty as the United States. No country's been so loved as it was during several decades in the 20th century, particularly after the Second World War, or after fighting two fronts against the Japanese imperialists and the German militarists. The United States and its allies brought both enemies to unconditional surrender and then in one of the greatest acts of generosity in the history of the world, rebuilt the enemies that it had just vanquished. And then like the Athenians, the arrogance of the human soul brought Americans into perpetual war. And for the last 70 years, there's not been a single year where America has not been in war. Whether it was a Cold War against the Soviet Union, whether it was a hot war in Vietnam, in the Middle East, invading various Latin American countries, destabilizing countries all across Africa, the United States has become a militarized democracy. And now we find the phenomenon of Donald Trump, who if we are not careful, like Alcibiades, will be that catalytic elixir that brings America into the dust of a national security state and a totalitarian system. Within this context, I want to read you a recent article um, published in Eudaimonia. And it's written by a gentleman named Umar Haq. And a friend of mine, uh, Lawrence Bloom, sent it to me. And I found it so striking as I was preparing my notes for the lecture on Alcibiades that I want to read you parts of it because the question he asks is do Americans know how much trouble they're in and the subtitle is why America is at a crossroads in history and there may not be any way back to normal sane or civilized And his uh, article begins thus. 
a president who invokes absolute authority to pardon himself, an ambassador to Germany who declares publicly he wants to topple the German government, senators, the most powerful people in democracy, save the president, knocking on the door of a detainment center, looking for kids separating the, from their parents and are being kept in cages only to be denied by the guards who laugh at the senators contemptuously call the police and have them shoot away like nobodies. Do Americans understand how much trouble they're in? How grave the threat to America's constitutional democracy, its civil society, its place in the world, and its ongoing survival? When I ask this question, you'll protest, of course I do. Or perhaps you'll say you're overstating it, in which case the answer is you don't know how much trouble the United States is in. Here's a truth you probably would rather not hear. America is at a crossroads, a point of no return. A democratic society cannot really survive the three assaults listed above and go on being a democracy. Now, these may seem just like daily events in the ongoing sad saga of a troubled nation under an incredibly mentally deranged man. But they are not just that. They contain great significance to history which I feel Americans are doing a very poor job of interpreting and presenting to the American people. Let me take them one by one. When a society has a leader who claims to not just be above the law, but to be the law, then such a society cannot be a democracy or a constitutional republic, as was understood since the time of the democracy in Greece. When a leader has absolute power, then rights cannot be said to exist. And there is no point to voting, to representation, or legislation. If the will of the people or the representatives can be abrogated at any time by a leader who can pardon anyone absolutely for anything, beginning with himself, then democracy ceases to matter in any way whatsoever. That is how you get 90% of the people vote for Putin in every single election that Putin has run in. Now, I really want you to understand that, Hawk says, when a society crosses this line, there is usually no going back. When Caesar crossed the Rubicon, Rome was finished. When the Sun King Louis XIV declared, I am the state, the French Ansan regime was finished and the revolution was a foregone conclusion. The same is true for America. If this line is crossed, there is likely to be no way back to democracy. The same is true of senators who can't even access a detainment center which is a euphemism for a concentration camp, a place where people, children in this case, are literally concentrated with no recourse to rights, simply vanished and disappeared into thin air into a black hole. That's the point of a concentration camp, to create a black hole that is impossible for anyone to see into, for the press, for intellectuals, for citizens, even the democratic leaders of the most powerful body in the United States, the Senate and the Congress. What is really happening here? Democratic representation is being made impotent, visibly and publicly, so everyone can see just how powerful it is going against authoritarianism. Authoritarians are demonstrating their absolute power to destroy the daily workings of democracy. Think about it. Mere nobodies, flunkies, 
guards call the police who tell senators they have to leave. They are able to render the most powerful people in society, the senators, utterly, totally, laughably impotent. But the senators are supposed to be the people's most powerful representatives. And if they cannot gain access to children hidden away in dungeons, in cages, then who can? Now let me come to the third line crossed in just this one fatal day. The German ambassador from the United States who told the German leaders that he is out to quite literally bring down the German government. What is the effect of this? It is to make America a pariah state, an international outcast, shunned, reviled, a society that civilized ones keep its distance from, lest its weakness infects them too. And this is precisely what authoritarians want. Do you know how abusers isolate their victims from friends, family, colleagues, twisting the truth, telling them that they are the only ones who are looking out for them, and the ones who genuinely care for them are the ones who will really hurt them. And that way, isolated alone, the victim is weakened, afraid, hesitant, and the abuser's job is easy. This is just what authoritarians do. Why did the Soviets bring down an iron curtain? It wasn't really to protect people from decadent capitalism. It was to isolate the Russians and keep them dumb, ignorant, and weak. Why do China, Saudi Arabia, and North Korea block and censor the internet and outside media? It isn't to make their people virtuous. It is to keep them isolated so that they never form bonds with anyone but their rulers. This line, too, cannot be easily uncrossed. Once a society becomes a pariah state, it isn't as if people make friends with them again overnight. They are treated with suspicion, a little hostility, fear, and shame wherever they go. Trust disintegrates. But anyone who has ever had a relationship knows trust, once lost, is the hardest thing of all to repair. So let me ask you again, do you think Americans know how grave their plight is right now? That they're at a crossroads? That they face these extraordinary dangers? Becoming a pariah state, shunned by the world, becoming an authoritarian, authoritarian state, the rule of law shattered, in which absolute power is taken away from the people and concentrated among the most ruthless, vicious, brutal, and inhumane individuals at the pinnacle of political power. And going from being an open, vibrant, optimistic society to being something more like the Soviet Union, a place that, most troubling of all, had no road back to being a democracy. I wanted to read that because I wanted us all to take a moment in the midst of the cascade of outrages and obscenities and racist, sexist, xenophobic Twitter feeds of Donald Trump, to which we're slowly becoming habituated to realize that, like in ancient Athens, we're crossing some very fundamental lines about what it means to be a democracy, and what it means to be civilized. And once these lines are crossed, very seldom in history is there any turning back. And so that's why today in this great books, I wanted to juxtapose the rise, the dazzling rise of Athens and the tragic fall of Athens through the perpetual war, the Peloponnesian War, and the dazzling rise of the US 
in the 20th century, America's century as it's called, and the collapse and fall of a democratic state in public through a cascade of shocks to which we've become habituated so that we can take a few moments to see how a single individual can either build a country, lead a nation, think of Gandhi, you think of Mandela, you think of Martin Luther King, you think of George Washington, they're great individuals of the historical process. Then you think of Stalin, you think of Mao, you think of Hitler, you think of Trump. And raising up a distant mirror, you think of Alcibiades. Alcibiades was born in the pinnacle of Athens in 450 BC, when Athens was glittering before the rest of the world. The golden age. He was born into a wealthy family. He was a relative of Pericles. Pericles was the man who created the brilliance of Athens. He was handsome. He was well endowed in every way, Alcibiades. He became a good friend of Socrates and they fought in several local battles and wars that the Athenians had in the four 40s and the 430s and Alcibiades and Socrates shared a tent together and it's recorded by Plutarch that uh, on one occasion Socrates saved the life of Alcibiades threw himself in front of Alcibiades and fought off the attackers it's told that Alcibiades, one time seeing Socrates losing ground, turned his horse around and galloped to save Socrates. They were the greatest of friends. And he was considered brilliant in every way. And the man of all the students Socrates had, apparently, he loved Alcibiades. Alcibiades appears in the great symposium, Plato's Paean to Love. Alcibiades shows up in the middle of the proceedings. And uh, so Alcibiades was a man of a great personal power. It's said that when he was a little boy, he was fighting with the other little boys and was losing, and so he took the hand of, what, of the boy that was beating him and bit into his hand. And everybody said, you're fighting like a woman, Alcibiades. And Alcibiades says, no, I'm fighting like a lion. And um, uh, the story of, uh, of uh, how he uh, got married actually is another interesting story. There was a wealthy man Alcibiades on a dare walks up to him and out of nowhere slugs him in the face just to show that he could do it. And then he was remorseful. He went to the man, knocked on his door, walked into the front door, took off his robe and stood completely naked before uh, the uh, gentleman and said, do to me anything you want to do to punish me for what I did. And the man was so overwhelmed by Alcibiades' charm that he gave him his daughter in marriage. <laughs> and Alcibiades um, was um, uh, completely unfaithful uh, to the point that the woman uh, left him. And in those days, if you were going to file for divorce, the woman had to go into the court 
And just as she was starting the proceedings, Alcibiades sweeps in, picks her up in his arms, walks out of the court, through the, the, the market, and takes her home. And uh, she dropped all the charges. He had a dog. And to gain attention, he cut off the dog's tail. And everyone said, Alcibiades, what are you doing? And he says, as long as they're talking about me, that's the only thing that matters. He would dress up in ostentation clothing. He had horses that he ran uh, in the Olympics. And he distinguished himself by his horses, his chariots won the first, second, and third place in the Olympics. Uh, he could ride a horse masterfully. He was one of the best horse men in, in uh, Athens at that time. He could wield a sword. Uh, and he was a remarkably effective speaker. So in every way, Alcibiades was a larger than life figure. And then he went into politics. The Peloponnesian War had started, generated and instigated by Pericles. But Pericles had died of the plague in 425. And one of the generals, a man by the name of Nicias, had brought peace between Athens and Sparta, the peace of Nicias. And everything settled down. Think Obama and Iran and the nuclear deal. Obama, like Nicias, brought peace. And then Alcibiades, like Trump, began to agitate in the agora, in the marketplace, and in the people's assembly. And in Greece in those days, it was a direct democracy. We don't have direct democracies anywhere in the world that at least I know about. Uh, where everybody has a say. We have representative democracies where we vote for representatives that make the laws representing our interests. Uh, but in Athens, it was a direct democracy and everybody had to show up. And so sometimes there would be five, 6,000 men. Men were the only ones that were allowed, free men, not the slaves, not the women, to come. So that how you would influence was through rhetoric. And Alcibiades could give amazingly strong speeches. And he started to agitate, to instigate war. So the peace of Nicias was undone. And as he began to instigate war, he cast his sights on Sicily and started to agitate the young men in Athens for an invasion of Sicily. Sicily hadn't done anything. It's just that he wanted to do something spectacular. And Nicias argued as strenuously as he possibly could. And then through trickery and, and bribery and corruption of all kinds, Alcibiades bought off the necessary people and contrived, and the next thing anyone knew, the Athenian assembly had voted to invade Sicily. Right as they had come to the decision, one night, young men frolicking in a drunken, debauched state with Alcibiades on a feast day where the women would, uh, would consecrate themselves in a particular way. And they had what they called these Hermes, dedicated to the god Hermes in the Roman pantheon to Mercury. And they were phallic symbols, on top of which was the head of the god. 
And these young men went and defaced um, uh, the Hermes around the city. And an act of real sacrilege against the gods right at the moment when the Athenians were praying to the gods for victory over the Sicilians. And it was a great scandal. And the Athenians were unsure what to do because Alcibiades had just been voted to be one of the generals along with Nicias. So you had the peacemaker and the warmonger both given equal power by the Athenians who were unsure how much power to really give this young Alcibiades who was just hell bent on war. And then all of a sudden this scandal happened. Much confusion, 130 ships, 5,100 men, 1,300 archers nevertheless sailed for Sicily. When they got to Sicily, they won some skirmishes, and then word came from Athens that Alcibiades needed to be brought back to face trial for sacrilege against the gods. And he heard that it was going to happen. And in the treacherously treacherousness of his own soul, right when the Athenians were going against the, the forces of Syracuse, the major city in Sicily, Alcibiades secretly sent word to the Syracusans the strategy of the Athenians. And the Athenians lost the skirmish and eventually the war. And then as he was brought back on the ship, when they went to port for fuel and food along the way back, he escaped. And he went to Sparta, the enemy of the Athenians in this great Peloponnesian war that he had fomented from Athens to renew against Sparta, attack Sicily. He's hauled back to Athens. He jumps ship and goes directly to the Spartans and tells the Spartans that the Athenians are acting in a treacherous way against him. And then he gives the Spartans some of the key strategic intelligence of the Athenians. And the king Agus of Sparta welcomed him into the court. And Alcibiades dazzled everyone. Think Trump, dazzling everyone. Everyone always is looking at what Trump's doing. And Agus goes out on some campaign and what does Alcibiades do but seduces the queen. who gives birth to a daughter. And King Agus was so shocked and scandalized. The entire city of, of Sparta was so shocked that Alcibiades is forced to escape. He then goes to the Persians, in what is now Turkey. And he starts to give information to the Persians about the Spartans and the Athenians so that the Persians start to have the advantage against their longtime foes. And everywhere he goes, he debauches women in a flagrant disregard for civility. He's a sexual predator. And then in the ebb and flow of the battles, he realizes that 
Athens is genuinely falling. And through one intrigue after another, Alcibiades then goes over to the side of the Athenians again <laughs> and leads the Athenians to victory against the Spartans and the Persians. And finally, he returns to Athens, terrified, according to Plutarch, that once he lands, even though he's brought great victories, he will be seized. But he's welcomed. Although on the day he lands in Athens, it turns out it's the one day of the year when Pallas Athena, the great goddess, the patron goddess of Athens is taken down and cleaned. So Athens is hidden for a day from its patron goddess. Athens is named after Athena. And it's considered to be the most inauspicious day of the whole year. And so while the people are rejoicing that Alcibiades his treacherousness understood, but strangely accepted. They also ponder that the day he landed was the unluckiest day of the Athenian calendar. More battles, more treachery. And finally, the Athenians can't stand it anymore and they throw him out again. And he goes to the Persians. And the Persians don't want to have anything to do with him. And finally, he's put away into a city and he begins to debauch the young women. One in particular. And according to Plutarch, no one's quite sure how he, why he met his end. But the story was that the brothers and father of the woman he debauched came and burnt his house down. And as he fled naked into the night, they brought him down with darts and arrows. And that was the demise of Alcibiades. But by then, Athens was in rubble. A It's my phone there. I'm sorry about this. Athens was in rubble. The democracy was replaced by a tyranny. And the democracy that had built the brilliance of that imperial system was vanquished uh, in a way that was tragic and irredeemable. And historians to the present day discuss the role of Alcibiades in the destruction of the Athenian Republic. And so when we, we consider the rise and fall of Athens, when we consider the rise and fall of the United States, we need to look at Trump as a highly dangerous individual, in some ways larger than life, in some ways uncontrollable, in some ways deeply mysterious. But like Alcibiades, has built his power by a series of just simple outrages against virtually everything that civilized society considers both right and wrong. 
all of us know that racism is wrong. And just yesterday, Trump tells four women of color in the US Congress that if they don't like it, they can just go back from, to where they came from. That's bigotry of the worst kind. That's demagoguery of the worst kind. A demagogue is someone who takes the shadow emotions, who takes the dark forces of the soul, the racist forces, the fear of foreigners, and manipulates it to divide, to cause fear, to cause anger, and thereby consolidate power. Now, one of the aspects that I want to tease out today, which is very important if you look at the rise of tyrants, and the classic, of course, is Adolf Hitler in Germany in the 1930s, 1920s, just about 90, 100 years ago, is the paralysis of the progressive forces. One of the most extraordinary facts about the current situation now in the United States is that Nancy Pelosi and the Democratic leadership in the Congress refused to impeach Trump. Think about that. You have a man that is manifestly unqualified in every moral, political, sense of that term and the democrats won't impeach and you can feel trump getting stronger and stronger and the democrats getting weaker and weaker because they're tied up in their own indecision and fear and lack of clarity about what they need to do they came out of the last election winning a landslide of over 40 seats in the US Congress. And they've completely dissipated that momentum away. And now there's infighting, actively encouraged by Trump. That's what happened in the 20s and the early 30s with the rise of the Nazis. It's like Edmund Burke said, the reason why evil prevails is that the good men do nothing. The good men and women do nothing. And you see it playing out right now in the Congress of the United States. And there is, in fact, this deep collusion going on both in the Senate and the House, with Trump. The collusion to pass a border bill that does nothing to help the babies in cages. Collusion in the Senate to pass the judges, confirm the judges that Trump wants. Collusion in both houses to continue to erode the civil liberties of American citizens, and in particular, the press. Quietly passed by the Democrat and Republican leadership. It's extraordinary, my friends, what is occurring right now in the United States. And just like in Athens, 2,500 years ago, descending into the chaos and corrosiveness of war, and through the manipulations and machinations of Alcibiades and others, 
fake news. What is true? What is true when Alcibiades starts with the Athenians, ends up with the, the Spartans, moves to the Persians, go back to the Athenians, and then ends up with the Persians again? Where is truth? Where is morality? Where is virtue? Every American needs to be pondering these things very deeply today. And it's almost impossible because we're, we're being brutalized and desensitized by one shock after another so that we're losing track of what's not only what's real, but what is strategically in our interest. The Athenians tried initially to stop Alcibiades, and he escaped. In our day, the Athenians, the Americans, are not even trying to stop Trump. We're in the process of letting him get away with it. That's what it means when you don't impeach. It's basically saying, we're going to let you get away with it. And if you let them get away with it, then what can you expect for the next phase of American history? So, as I always do, I like to articulate these issues in the spirit of truth pursued, not truth possessed. I wanted to open up a distant mirror from ancient Athens and Alcibiades to reflect more deeply on the outrages of Trump and the danger, the extraordinary present danger to the American Republic. And urge all of us at a time where numerous countries, Bolsonaro in Brazil, Urban in Hungary, Brexit in the UK, Modi in India, Xi in China, Duarte in the Philippines. Country after country is succumbing to totalitarian tendencies, undergirded by racist, sexist, xenophobic tendencies that are being fomented, concurrent with a deconstruction of truth. We're entering the 1984 world of war is peace and peace is war and truth and falsehood become interchangeable as one thing. And that's the strategy of the tyrant. And that's why I read that article at the beginning of this lecture because I want us all to ponder the gravity of our present moment. So that somehow, particularly in the United States, there can be a quickening of our collective soul. And that people of goodwill will somehow be able to take in what needs to be done and exercise the kind of leadership that is required to save the nation at this critical hour. Because the conclusion is far from certain. And I do know that if we don't impeach, we won't win in 2020. And it is now late summer and uh, time is marching on. So I'll leave it here uh, and um, open it up. Uh, let's see who's, um, who's uh, on the... Um, 
who's on the list here. I see uh, Laurel Madsen, one of our students. She was in Chartres last week in the doctoral writing course. Um, I see uh, Dave, I see a, a number of our students. Uh, so I'll uh, just uh, open it up to any of our students that want to comment at this time. Um, obviously, we'll, I'll send the link to this um, uh, out to everybody, uh, this article, so everybody can read it and, and ponder it. But are, is there anybody that wants to, to make a comment or ask a question at this time? Vivian. Good to see you, Vivian. She's been with us over the last several weeks in Chartres. It was wonderful to see you, Vivian. Hello, how are you? Very well. Are you back home now? Uh, no, I'm still in Chartres. I'm gonna stay for the uh, Madonna Rising. I'm, I'm working from home here and- um, Oh, fantastic. Yeah, yeah, and enjoying yeah. myself, going to the market tomorrow and just having too much fun and have some friends <laughs> coming and yeah, so I'm, um, being pulled back into politics in my country, though, which is, you know, not fun. But anyway, I'm um, okay. So I held a um, I held a, a move on dot org impeach Trump event at our farm and invited um, all the people that normally come to our events. And um, nobody showed up. I had I had um, 32 people signed up for it and then nobody came. So what happened that weekend is there was some, uh, Pelosi came out with her excuses of why she didn't want to impeach Trump. And the, and the number one reason was that um, she wants him in jail um, instead of, you know, that it would make it so that the Senate would vote and he, he would not be able to be tried after he was, um, you know, no, no longer in office. So that was her number one reason that she said. And um, also, um, can you are you still hearing me yes so today um pelosi um you know on the 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 four um congresswomen of color that were you know called out by him she is put a um a referendum to the um to the house that everybody has to vote on to show whether they want to censor him or not and there's never been a president that has been censored so she's making everybody go on record. So um, I, I, I think um, Nancy Pelosi is a, is a shrewd politician. And I hope that, she, you know, I hope that she's, you know, I think they're, 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 they're playing this game. It's very dangerous. As you said, we are in dire straits in our country. Yeah, it's, it's uh, thank you for that, uh, Vivian. I, I want to be honorable in my, remarks obviously about the uh, democratic leadership. As a historian, I also see echoes uh, of times past where it's so hard to stand up against the tyrant yeah. unless you are, are a person of, of deep moral rectitude. And I fear that, mm. that Nancy Pelosi may not be that person. And I, I, uh, uh, it makes me quake in my bones uh, because as, a, as an American, as a 10th generation American, my people first came over to American shores in 1686 and um, from uh, Provence in Southern oh. France and uh, on my father's side. And um, I think that, that if there was leadership around the impeachment issue, and clear communication as to why it's an imperative, I think the American people would overwhelmingly support it. Oh, I'm it. so for it, it's ridiculous. I, I was there, I, like I said, I wouldn't, have had, I wouldn't have had that event and hosted yeah. it at my home, but I don't think that the American people are there. So anyway, that's just, that's all I have. Good, well listen, thank you and enjoy Chartres. Sure. Enjoy uh, Chartres. Amy Blumenshine, you're, very informed on these matters. I would love to hear from you. There we go, Amy. Right. Uh, um, what's your view on these matters? Well, Jim, I of course agree with you uh, that these are the tools of the tyrant that we're seeing and, and thank you for elevating Naomi Klein's work. This is the shock doctrine happening to us. Yeah. Um, my church was among those this last weekend that had 24-hour people 
posted to act as sanctuary. Uh, we were part of the uh, rapid response. As it turned out, uh, you know, you, you can't help but feel played with around a lot of these issues. And it's, it's amazing to me how little scrutiny there is over what is actually happening. It's really yeah. a very confusing period. And, and why anybody would believe um, someone who's constantly lying, uh, it, it's, it, it's just, it's very hard uh, to put yourself in the place of, I mean, it does seem to be a willing suspension of disbelief. And my explanation is that people are so deeply anxious, number one, because the economy is failing most people in this country. There are just so many folks doing very poorly. And number two, because we all are picking up uh, that the climate is changing in disturbing ways. And even those who can't voice that consciously are, are experiencing the anxiety and that causes people to uh, try to come up with, uh, number one, uh, someone to protect them and number two, uh, to accept the inaccurate explanations for, for what's wrong. So um, it, it is a bizarre time we're in. I wish I had um, a clear solution to it. I, I do think that we're at a cusp and I totally um, support those members and leaders who are members of Congress and leaders who are pushing us to more profound changes. Um, it's, it's, you know, as you know from our work around climate, et cetera, that we need to drastically change how we're living on this planet. And the current system will not, yep. not work. It's not working now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, let me ask you, Amy, because you, you know, you know but just so everybody knows, Amy has been in the movement since you know, cradle basically, <laughs> and uh, 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 but just uh, uh, I wanted to get your sense of the pulse out there. Given what Vivian said, uh, Amy, around you know she called an impeachment event, no one showed up. Um, what what is your read? You're because you're there in Minnesota, right? Oh, yes. Uh, Ilhan Omar is my representative, very proudly so. She's, I count her as somewhat of a personal friend. Oh, really? I didn't know that. Yes. Oh, well, good for you. You've got she a was, uh, lot of She was an early volunteer on my son's campaign for the Minnesota House. And uh, she taught us some Somali language. And, and hopefully, we had a hand in formation. That's so fantastic. I couldn't be prouder. And as I said in my in my little comments, I, I just wish people had a better sense of who she is, because uh, it is such a contrast. She is this uh, very slight woman, uh, you know, um, not imposing in stature. I mean, you would you would put Trump against. She's such a bully in comparison, not to mention his, his actual political power, but then also his physical presence. And to, you know, to consider her a threat, one of the most uh, physically non-threatening people you can imagine, it's, it's, it's really quite incredible. And, and a mother as well with um, a good family situation. So, ah, well, anyway, only, um, yeah. Well, anyway, you want to know what the pulse is here. And I think all of us are in our own bubbles, unfortunately. Um, and as I uh, tried to point out, there are so many crises to respond to. Um, and, and I'm afraid too many um, feel that they don't need to pay attention and it's overwhelming and okay, so I need to know about immigration now. Oh, so I need to know about impeachment now. Um, all of this is very complex. There are arguments on various sides and, and um, 
you know, I would say our dominant media in, in my area is pointing out how little truth there is in what the president says. Um, and, and we do, you know, for, the, for instance, the, the fraud going on with the various programs, the, the um, newspaper did carry how the, most of these um, assistance to the farmers who were hurt by the Trump trade plan uh, that most of that assistance went to the very wealthy farmers in violation of how the rules were written. You know, this just goes on and on. There's so much to pay attention to. I, I think people are, you know, the shock doctrine, there's a reason for it. Keep them reeling. Yeah. So you want me to say, if people here are for impeachment, and well, again, it's one of those issues, that people say, you know, what is this guy doing there? But they're, meanwhile, Minnesota is being targeted um, as a vulnerable state to go into the Republican fold. And, and uh, the other issues I, I talked with you about, uh, you know, it, it's what demagogues do. They find the divisions and they, yeah. they promote them. So it is, it is something, it's, I, agree, I agree it's dire. I'm sorry I don't have a definitive uh, reaction to give you. Well, no, I think you're describing it very ably, you know, there's, it's a time of confusion. It's a time where, you know, both truth is being deconstructed while the complexity of the issues is so intricate, not only inside the issue, but as it relates to all the other issues out there, that the, the public needs to be better informed than probably any time in the history of the country, history of the world, um, at the moment when it's the most asleep and seduced by consumerism and private concerns. And, and then when someone like Trump pops up, you, you, you don't know how to come out of your own stupor. And you keep hoping that it'll just kind of go away. And, um, and um, that numbness of of heart and mind, uh, which is the point of the shock doctrine, is just all too easy to uh, succumb into. And that's one reason why I wanted to reference Alcibiades and the Athenian um, uh, tragedy as a distant mirror to our own time, just to give people a different perspective and hope that in some way they can wake up to uh, the gravity of the crisis in which we find ourselves, that this is, this is not a joke. Uh, it may feel like a bad dream, but it could very quickly turn into a nightmare of no return. And I know, Amy, like Vivian, you guys have been on the, you've been on the barricades, boy, for years and years and years. And, and uh, so your voice and wisdom and your perspective are very important for us in this, in this critical time. So I just wanted to hear what you had to say. Well, thank you for that affirmation, Jim. <laughs> there are a lot of us doing this kind of work, that's for sure. Yeah, yeah. So is there anyone else that wants to um, chip in here uh, before we uh, call this to a close? I got Laura, Laura Madsen. How are you, Laura? London. Um, after amazing two weeks, our, our dissertation week and then uh, the week with Rick Tarnas. And I feel that, that that particular week with Rick helped me to understand this. I'm, I'm Canadian, so not that we're not involved and we certainly know about Trump and he's all over the papers here in England as well. So he's a global figure. And... Um, I, I feel the, 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 the confusion, all of these things you're naming, that the, the sort of stupor people seem to be like, they can't quite believe what's going on. We're also are in our own bubble, like Amy was saying. And I feel that those are all, it's, it's like this squeeze going on that's forcing us to to develop in ways we haven't had to yet as individuals, as people who care. 
who have heart and uh, like Linda Tucker and her white lions, finding our place that leads us to our heart in a time of crisis. That's what I feel our journey is. And each of us has a different, not all of us are political animals. I wouldn't say that I'm one. I'm, I'm deeply caring for, for nature and environment. And I will be do politics when that's part of it. But it's, I feel like we're being called to wake up our heart. So hearing more news, hearing all of the, you know, and the how to do this from a to do place isn't really, I feel like we're being called to be led from a courage we didn't even know we had. And to step up in ways that are, that we don't even really know uh, what they are. But if we listen, I feel there's a calling, there's something calling us to some other place. So it's like a birth, a birth process I sense going on. And I feel that was very much what Rick Tarnas was pointing us to. This is like we're in a process of birth, which is hard labor. <laughs> you know, it's not easy. And it, you don't know the outcome. You know, maybe mother and baby die. I mean, we don't really know. Um, so I feel like we have to broaden a lot of our personal, political, I mean, on every level. But it's through our heart that it becomes broadened. Anyway, that's that's all I have. I don't have any solutions. And as I say, a little, I'm a little bit, um, what's the word? Not protected, but a little bit removed. Like sometimes I, you, you name people, and I, ha I don't know who they are. I, I'm not even sure. I, I know how the politics in the U.S. works. It's a little different than Canada, but, but it's a glo he's a global figure, so. Anyway, that's all I have to say. Well, thank you. And it was wonderful to spend time with you and uh, Mike uh, uh, yeah. in Chartres. It was a beautiful uh, time yeah, well, together. I'm so sorry you lost your computer. That is so awful. To yeah. Lose a like that. I am so, so sorry. Yeah. It's, so, it so great. sorry. Um, yeah. yeah, one of the things everyone, and, um, and I think we'll probably bring the, the call to a close, but just to fill out a little bit more about what Laura was saying about Rick Tarnas. Rick Tarnas uh, is one of the great astrologers and we were studying Astronomica in Chartres, and which is the seventh and the highest liberal arts. And it's about how the, the universe breathes together and how the movement of the planets influence human behavior. And we're in a particular um, alignment of Uranus and Pluto uh, and it's to give you a reference Uranus and Pluto were uh, conjunct in the 1960s and early 70s you remember those of you I, that was my generation it was full of revolutionary fervor Vietnam War the Kennedys were assassinated riots in 40 cities across America put a man on the moon you know, the Beatles, the flower children, there was an explosion of culture. And that's what's happening now. The destabilization, Obama, Trump, Arab Spring, uh, 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 all the uh, uh, Occupy, the Me Too movement, uh, people coming on the streets, Parkland High School kids uh, standing up against the gun violence, uh, and Trump, right? So you had the flower children in the 60s and Richard Nixon. You have uh, uh, the beautiful, beautiful Malalas of the world, and you've got you know, the Trumps of the world, all in a profusion of revolution and deconstruction. And, and um, like it's some, in some ways, it's like the forces of hell are being unleashed. Mm -hmm. The other thing that, that uh, 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 is worth pointing out is that the United States as a country is experiencing its Pluto return. Many of you who follow astrology know that uh, when you're 28 years old, you have your Saturn return. You know, where Saturn was the day you were born when you reached to be 28. And that's a defining moment in your life. It's a, it's, it condenses things. There's a gravitas to Saturn. 
It takes Pluto 248 years to go around to get to your Pluto return. In 1776, the United States is going through its Pluto return, and Pluto is the god of Hades. There's something deeply Dionysian about Pluto, deeply destructive about Pluto. So the fact that Trump is president during our Pluto return is an extraordinary synchronicity of planetary alignments in human history. And we're going into a Saturn-Pluto, um, uh, I think, opposition, while we're, there's a Uranus-Pluto square, and the United States is going through its Pluto return. So the, the, um, the um, hellishness of politics in America right now is completely aligned with what's going on in the planetary alignments around planet Earth. It's uh, uh, quite an extraordinary thing. And it's not to say that there's, there's anything predictive about astrology. Um, uh, and certainly astrology will not save us, mm -hmm. as someone just put into the uh, chat, that's absolutely true. But astrology can help us understand our situation at a deeper level, a deeper layer. And uh, I think that was the utility of, of Rick over these last seven days in Chartres. It was a very, very powerful, powerful time. Um, and so uh, we'll bring it to a close uh, now. And I want to thank everyone. Um, uh, but I just wanted to pause on a uh, Mid-July day, the moon is uh, full moon today. We're going to also have a moon eclipse later on uh, tonight. So if you haven't had the awareness that the moon is full tonight, there's going to be mm -hmm. eclipse of the moon. Uh, please uh, just note that. And on this full new moon, I just thought it would be a good time to, to contemplate deeply the historical vicissitudes of fate that are besetting a great nation and remind all of us that acts have consequences and consequences matter. And that when you pass certain thresholds, oftentimes there's no turning back. And the United States is crossing these thresholds. And we need to take that very, very seriously and rise up as a nation, uh, if we can, uh, to save our republic uh, and um, save the earth. So thank you, everyone. I'll be uh, talking with you next month on one of the Romans and uh, discussing the, um, the decline and fall of the Roman Republic as another distant mirror refracting onto our own time uh, that can hopefully 